on World News Tonight. Take on Trump. Running mate turns rival. Can Mike Pence shake up the race for the US presidential election? Find out tonight. Search continues. Investigators and rescue teams struggle to find and identify victims of India's deadly train crash. Priceless damage. The World Bank assesses the destruction of the Nova Kafkovka. How much damage was caused? More details tonight. And paying tribute. D-Day veterans return to beaches of Dunkirk to remember fallen comrades on Memorial Day. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and this is World News. We're starting off tonight's broadcast with updates on the darkness that's covering the Atlantic seaboard of North America. As smoke from Canadian wildfires drifted south, covering cities in a thick yellow haze, schools along the U.S. East Coast cancelled outdoor activities, airline traffic halted, and millions of Americans were advised to stay inside. Almost the entire Atlantic coast received air quality alerts from the U.S. National Weather Service. Canada has been experiencing an unusually early and intense start to its wildfire season, which is shaping up to be the nation's worst ever. Hundreds of forest fires have scorched an area almost four times the size of South Korea and so far displaced more than 120,000 people from their homes. Many of the fires have been burning for several days and are said to have been started by lightning strikes. There are currently some 400 ongoing fires in Canada, of which 240 have been determined to be out of control as of Wednesday. Smoke from the wildfires burning across Canada has been crossing into the U.S. since last month, but that has intensified with the latest fires in Quebec triggering air quality alerts to be issued in 15 states, from Vermont to South Carolina. According to a U.S. Environmental Protection Agency metric for air pollution, the air quality index exceeded a staggering 400 at times in parts of New York City and Pennsylvania. A level of 50 or under is considered good, and anything over 300 is considered hazardous when even healthy people are advised to limit outdoor physical activity. As a result, we are encouraging New Yorkers to stay home indoors tonight and tomorrow whenever possible, especially our vulnerable New Yorkers. All New Yorkers should limit outdoor activity to the greatest extent possible. New York City closed beaches, parks and zoos. Schools have shifted recess indoors and outdoor performances have been canceled as well as Major League Baseball games. The Federal Aviation Administration paused and slowed flights due to the smoke limiting visibility. As people scramble once again for face masks, New York will be making 1 million N95 masks available at state facilities starting Thursday. We have to take each situation clearly, but this is extremely dangerous air outside. This is an environment where we are recommending every single New Yorker, if they don't have to, stay indoors. That's a very strong recommendation. Last year, the United Nations warned that a warming climate and land use changes would lead to more wildfires globally. Experts say wildfire seasons are becoming longer and because of the hot and dry conditions caused by climate change, the blazes are spreading faster and burning larger areas. More than 950 firefighters and personnel have arrived from the U.S., Australia, New Zealand and South Africa and more are due to arrive in Canada soon. Now moving on to yet another disaster as scores of victims of India's rail crash remain unidentified. Authorities are using DNA testing to help desperate relatives bury their loved ones. Many are struggling to find and claim the bodies. For four days, he's been trawling the hospitals that received victims of India's worst train crash in two decades. Mohammed Imam al Haq found the body of one of his nephews on Tuesday and sent him home for burial. But he's found no trace of his brother, who was also travelling on the Coromandel Express when it crashed last Friday, and whom Huck believes was among at least 288 people killed. What Huck believes were the remains of his other nephew were also claimed by another family. There is one nephew we have identified. He is my nephew, but there are five more claimants who are saying he is their relative. That's why the body will have to undergo DNA tests, and only after that will we receive it. He will be given to whoever's DNA matches with the body. Many more families face a similar plight, with scores of bodies still lying in morgues unclaimed. 
Indian authorities have made fervent appeals to families to help identify them. But the task has been difficult as well as traumatic, because the crash occurred at high speed and many victims are beyond recognition. A senior police official told a list was made of distinguishing features for each body, and relatives could first view photographs. Authorities say they've taken DNA samples from all bodies in hospitals across the eastern state of Odisha. Nizam ad-Din was able to identify and collect the body of his 12-year-old grandson. He's my grandson. We're still unable to find the other two. We haven't been able to find his father and also his elder brother. We haven't been able to conclusively identify and find him either. We've only found one so far and I'm taking him with me. The disaster occurred when the Coromandel Express hit a stationary freight train, jumped the tracks, and hit another passenger train traveling in the opposite direction. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with Prince Faisal bin Farhan, the Saudi Foreign Minister, and foreign ministers from the Gulf Corporation Council as part of his visit to Saudi Arabia. The State Department said the U.S. and Saudi diplomats discussed a range of concerns between the two countries, as well as regional and global issues. Landing in Jeddah on Tuesday, America's top diplomat Antony Blinken began his three-day visit to the kingdom in an attempt to mend a strained but strategic relationship between Saudi Arabia and the US. The two nations have not seen eye to eye in years on a plethora of issues, among them oil prices, Iran policy and human rights. On Wednesday, Blinken met with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The two men discussed their shared priorities, including countering terrorism through the de-ISIS coalition, achieving peace in Yemen, and deepening economic and scientific cooperation, Blinken said on Twitter. According to a US official, another topic raised during the meeting was the potential normalization of Saudi-Israeli ties. This week, Secretary Blinken brought up the possibility of a rapprochement between Israel and Saudi Arabia, saying it was in the US national security interest to see the pair normalize ties, despite admitting it would no doubt take some time. The US official also said the two men discussed the conflict in Sudan. Both Washington and Riyadh have previously worked in conjunction to broker a lasting ceasefire between the warring factions in the African country. Blinken's visit comes days after Saudi Arabia, the world's largest oil exporter, pledged to further cut its oil production by one million barrels per day to boost flagging crude prices, in a move that could surge costs for American consumers at the pump, as well as worsening global inflation. The visit is also his first since Riyadh restored diplomatic relations with Tehran, in a recent deal brokered by Beijing, at a time when tensions have spiked between Tehran and Washington. Also on Blinken's agenda during the visit is a Gulf Cooperation Council meeting in Riyadh, expected to be attended by Qatar's Prime Minister and other top Gulf officials. Now over in Ukraine, officials say that destruction of the Novokakovka Dam has very serious consequences for essential services and the environment. The World Bank will support Ukraine by conducting a rapid assessment of damage and needs after the destruction of a huge hydroelectric dam on the front lines between Russian and Ukrainian forces. Novokokovka Dam in southern Ukraine lies some 30 kilometers east of Kherson. It crosses Ukraine's mighty Dnipro River and held 18 cubic kilometers of water within its 30-meter wall. Its destruction spells out huge consequences for the wider region, starting with towns downstream. Water levels are set to continue to rise for the next 3 to 10 days. Thousands of wild animals have died and hundreds of thousands of residents remain trapped without normal access to drinking water with risk of contamination. The breach is an ecological catastrophe with far-reaching consequences for the environment, notably for the marine life that depends on the reservoir. This video posted by a Ukrainian official claims to show stranded fish in the Dnipro floodwaters. In addition to the flooding, Kiev says at least 150 tons of oil has been spilled into the river, causing an estimated 50 million euros of damage. Also at risk is Crimea's canal irrigation system. The North Crimea Canal delivers water to Crimea from the Dnipro River and accounts for some 80 percent of Crimea's water. The dam's destruction could wreck the system of canals, threatening 120,000 hectares of crops which rely on irrigation. Further upstream lies the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. Water from the reservoir behind the Novokakovka dam is needed for the plant's cooling systems. 
The International Atomic Energy Agency says it's monitoring the situation, but that there are no immediate safety risks. Now for news on the U.S. elections. It is rare for a former vice president to take on their former running mate. This is what the former U.S. vice president is doing against his former boss, Donald Trump, as he took some sharp shots at the Republican frontrunner. That's why today, before God and my family, I'm announcing that I'm running for president of the United States of America. Former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence announced on Wednesday that he will challenge his former boss, Donald Trump, for the Republican presidential nomination. January 6th was a tragic day in the life of our nation. Once a Trump loyalist, Pence blasted the former president for his role in the 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. President Trump's words were reckless. They endangered my family and everyone at the Capitol. But the American people deserve to know that on that day, President Trump also demanded that I choose between him and the Constitution. Now voters will be faced with the same choice. I chose the Constitution, and I always will. Pence's speech in the early voting state of Iowa marked his most forceful condemnation to date of Trump's part in the Capitol riot when his former running mate was trying to overturn his 2020 election defeat to Democratic President Joe Biden. I believe that anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. And anyone who asks someone else to put them over the Constitution should never be president of the United States again. Many of Trump's diehard supporters view Pence's refusal to overturn the election result as treachery. Pence, who served as governor of Indiana and is a former congressman, still embraces many of Trump's policies while portraying himself as an even-keeled and consensus-oriented alternative. It is extremely rare for a vice president to run against a president he served under, and it has happened just a handful of times in U.S. history. Pence joins a crowded field of Republican White House hopefuls challenging Trump for the party's presidential nomination. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie who at one time was an advisor to Trump, entered the race on Tuesday and also took aim at the former president. By the way, I voted for him twice. Okay, am I a Trump voter then? <laughs> Hell no, man. North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum also jumped into the race on Wednesday, taking the number of candidates seeking the Republican presidential nomination into double digits. Pence enters the race with a mountain to climb polling at just 5% and trailing Trump by 44 points, according to a Reuters Ipsos opinion poll in May. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. Now, South Korea's major umbrella labor union has today announced that it will stop participating in the president-led economic, social and labor council for the first time in more than seven years. One of South Korea's two major labor umbrella groups, the Federation of Korean Trade Unions, has decided to suspend its participation in the trilateral consultative body between labor management and the government. The decision was made for the first time in more than seven years, meaning that the Economic, Social and Labor Council will lack power as a communication channel between the labor union and the government. Around 50 union members sat down in a meeting on Wednesday, which took around an hour. Afterward, the chairman of the FKTU, Kim Dong-myung, said that the union's decision is powerful and basically means that the FKTU has pulled out from the Economic, Social and Labor Council. He also said that it's more important for the union members to sort the issue out together. FKTU will not be leaving the council at this point, but the union said it can decide to completely withdraw from the council at any time. A result of Wednesday's discussion will be announced Thursday morning in a press conference at the Yongsan presidential office. This comes as President Yoon song a few weeks ago ordered a police crackdown on labor sit-ins. Late last month, an executive of the Federation of Korean Metal Workers Trade Unions was injured by police during a sit-in protest on top of a seven-meter-high steel structure, which the FKTU called an excessive use of force. The council was scheduled to hold the first governmental meeting with representatives of labor and management last Thursday, but was canceled due to the FKTU's absence. 
The UN administration and the Umbrella Labor Union have been at odds following the government's labor reform policies, such as sluggish adjustments to the working hours and wage system, and the administration's plans to increase accounting transparency of labor unions. EU lawmakers have reached a preliminary deal in April on a draft that could pave the way for the world's first comprehensive laws governing technology. Rapid advances in artificial intelligence such as Microsoft-backed OpenAI's ChatGPT are complicating governments' efforts to agree to laws governing the use of this technology. Rapid advances in artificial intelligence such as OpenAI's ChatGPT are complicating government's efforts to agree on laws governing the use of the technology. Let's take a look at some of the recent steps national and international governing bodies are taking to regulate AI tools. In the United States, the federal government is in the process of seeking input on regulations. The Federal Trade Commission's chief says the agency is committed to using existing laws to keep in check the dangers of AI. These include enhancing the power of dominant firms and turbocharging frauds. In April, Senator Michael Bennett introduced a bill that would create a task force to look at US policies on AI and identify how best to reduce threats to privacy, civil liberties and due process. The Biden administration said it was seeking public comments on potential accountability measures for AI systems. And so tech companies have a responsibility, in my view, to make sure their products are safe before making them public. Britain says it plans to split responsibility for governing AI between its regulators for human rights, health and safety and competition, rather than creating a new body. The Financial Conduct Authority has been tasked with drawing up new guidelines covering AI, and the competition regulator has said it would start examining the impact of AI on consumers, businesses and the economy. Speaking at a business conference in April, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said governments need sovereign capability over AI to manage risks to national security. AI. The Chinese government will seek to initiate AI regulations in its country. That's according to billionaire Elon Musk, who met with officials during his recent trip to China. In April, China's cyberspace regulator unveiled draft measures to manage generative AI services. The government wants firms to submit security assessments to authorities before they launch offerings to the public. At the same time, Beijing will support leading enterprises in building AI models that can challenge chat GPT, its Economy and Information Technology Bureau said. Key EU lawmakers have agreed on tougher draft rules to rein in generative AI and proposed a ban on facial surveillance. The European Parliament will vote on the draft of the EU's AI Act in June. EU tech chief Margrethe Vestager Everyone knows that this is a powerful thing. So within the next weeks, we will advance a draft of an AI code of conduct. Now, His Holiness Pope Francis underwent successful surgery to remove intestinal scar tissue and repair a hernia in his abdominal wall. The latest malady is to befall the 86-year-old pontiff who had part of his colon removed just two years ago. Doctors at Rome's Gemelli Hospital on Wednesday said Pope Francis was doing well after a three-hour operation to repair a hernia. The Pope, he is fine. Chief surgeon Dr. Sergio Alfieri called the surgery a success and said the Pope should have no limitations on his trips planned for this summer and other activities after he recovers. The surgical operation and the general anesthesia were well tolerated by the Pope. Now he's awake, he's uh, fine, and he's uh, already at work. Alfieri told reporters that no other ailments or pathologies were discovered during the operation and that he expected the 86-year-old pontiff to be in the hospital for five to seven days. But he cautioned that while strong, the Pope was elderly and a recent bout with bronchitis required that all precautions be taken regarding the timing of his hospital stay. Pope Francis was taken to the hospital after his weekly general audience in St. Peter's Square on Wednesday morning when he made no mention of the planned operation, the latest in a string of health issues in recent years. 
This is the third hospital stay for Pope Francis since Cardinals chose the Argentinian in 2013 to become the first Latin American pope. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Lionel Messi announced that he intends to join Major League Soccer side Inter Miami as a free agent after parting ways with French champions Paris Saint-Germain and snubbing a lucrative contract offer in Saudi Arabia. Australia has stated that it would introduce laws to the parliament next week banning public displays and sales of Nazi hate symbols, citing a rise in far-right activities at home. There would be exemptions for artistic, academic or religious use of swastikas, which has a spiritual significance in Hinduism, Jainism and Buddhism. The world's rarest marine mammal, the Vaquita porpoise, does not appear to have suffered a drop in its population since October 2021, according to new research published by Sea Shepherd, a non-governmental organization working to help prevent their extinction. Clashes erupted after Israeli forces mounted a rare raid into the Palestinian city of Ramallah in the occupied West Bank in what the military said was an operation to demolish the house of an assailant. A witness said a large military convoy arrived in downtown Ramallah, the seat of the Palestinian government, leading hundreds of Palestinians to gather in the area. Outside the Brazilian Congress and Supreme Justice buildings in the capital Brasilia, indigenous groups from all over the country protested against a bill that threatened their ancestral territories. The proposed law would impose a cut-off date for ancestral land claims in 1988, the year Brazil's current constitution was enacted. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you tonight with 45 U.S. World War II veterans, most now in their late 90s, who traveled to Normandy in France to mark the 79th anniversary of D-Day. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.